the map you see there on the power point represents the location of the Yoruba in modern Nigeria. But the, as a group, they are bigger than that. So we can draw a different kind of map that will represent them in different parts of the globe. And they are one of the best known African groups and one of the best researched in the world. They created formidable empire, uh, notably the Oyo Empire, whose territory extended as far as the eastern boundaries of modern Ghana. And their reach extended into what you will now call four countries. If Panyurbana developed, which is one of the concepts that I coined, and you will see the relevance of it, in which from the boundaries of Cameroon to Gambia, you are going to see traces of Yoruba influence. And these traces of Yoruba influence most prominently displayed in cultural items, subsequently crossed the Atlantic, uh, creating uh, a bigger Yoruba identity. At the core of this identity is language spoken by over 40 million people. And as a diasporic culture, that language has spread uh, with survivor patterns in Brazil, in Cuba, in Haiti, and some other places. And that language is connected to visual symbols, to religion, to artistic creation, to uh, literary creation, and to many things. In many ways, through that language and through the visual of its expression, a big archive has been created. And this archive, in many instances, is now part of the world heritage. So that there's hardly a major country in the world you go that you are not going to find an element of Yoruba, maybe in music, as in Asha, if you if you're in Germany, or if you're in Britain, the British Museum, if you're in London, you go to Peckham, there's Yoruba food to eat. And if you're in Liverpool, some stores will even greet you uh, in Yoruba language. From the 15th to the 19th centuries, most especially in the 18th century, the Yoruba were part of those who were funneled across the Atlantic. Two things happened. Uh, the first is that due to the stability provided by the Oyo Empire, you are not going to find many Yoruba people funneled across the Atlantic because that empire stabilized it. As the empire collapsed, and it began the process of that collapse, the Oyo Empire, in the 18th, late 18th century. That stability was gone, and thousands and thousands of Yoruba were funneled across the Atlantic. But then they became concentrated in countries like Brazil and Cuba, where they have been able to establish a dominant influence. If you look at the totality of the number in the slave trade, the Yoruba were lesser than some groups, other groups. But in terms of the cultural retention, uh, their influence is perhaps uh, the most prominent in Bahia, Brazil, in Cuba, in, in, in African cultures that spread globally in terms of the Orisha, Santeria, Voodoo, Candomblé, some uh, of the form variety where Yoruba influence also spread. And various arguments in the study of the African diaspora, various arguments in the study of 
the Black Atlantic. Various studies in the study of Atlantic history rely on the Yoruba data in terms of the arguments on the roots of consciousness, the roots of the African diaspora, in terms of the construction of Africanity, Africanism, um, African consciousness, whether it is the one by Cheikh Antadiop or the one by Ashanti, you find the insertion of the Yoruba into it. And there is tremendous cultural awareness in the age of globalization in which the Yoruba data is there. Nollywood, the third biggest film industry in the world today, following Bollywood and Hollywood, uh, has so many Yoruba elements. Today, if you fly British Airways, Lufthansa, if you click on world cinema, you are going to find one Yoruba film or the other. Or if you go on Netflix, you are going to find a Yoruba film. If you click on Netflix today, you are going to find a major movie called Nimbe, uh, which shows you the continuity of this culture. So those of us who study transnationalism, the concept of home and the homeland, the Yoruba data is very much embedded in what we do. And you can see many African, uh, sorry, many universities in the West now are teaching Yoruba language as part of uh, the relevance of this culture, the people. That is an introduction to this book that I'm talking about uh, and how this book shape some of the conversation uh, that I've, I've spoken about. And in this long, in this, in this book, which is comprehensive, it could have been bigger, but there's always a limited space in publishing. We spoke to the idea of the long historical period, the long historical formations, dating back to an archeological period before Christ dating back to 1000 AD and linking that archaeology to geography to the evolution of the people. And there is substantial late stone age evidence, early iron age evidence among the Yoruba. And by AD 1000, the, the, their first major kingdom, Ife, evolved and we provided a lot of analysis on, on this kingdom. Thereafter, we turn to the growth of what we call complex societies. Bear in mind, the Yoruba became one of the most urbanized in Africa. But not only that, they organized themselves into, into kingdoms with kings, leading to the emergence of so many kings. And these complex societies showed the use of metals and part of the achievements in carvings in sculpture have become part of world heritage recognized globally. Between the 15th and the 17th century, what you call the early modern in European history, a number of kingdoms and states emerged. The Eba people, the Jebu kingdoms, Owu, Ijesha kingdoms, and you have frontier states and zones in the forest, Ekiti, Okun, Igomina, all imagine uh, establishing a great deal of relevance uh, within the region with their neighbors to the east the Benin Empire. We were able to discover, although no one has written on it, that while we focus on the spread of the Yoruba westwards, we have not done major studies on their spread eastwards. And we're beginning to see some of these influences as far 
as Central Africa. And this is some of the research that has to consume many of us in the years to follow. By the 17th century, uh, a great deal of transformation had also taken place, which was the age of empire. The Yoruba became the most successful in building what we call land-based empire. Land-based empire relied on your capacity to create an economic basis of power, to develop a land army, and they were able to develop an operate land army based on the use of cavalry. But underpinning that army was an extensive, elaborate agrarian economy that produced massive surplus to generate tremendous wealth. And that wealth uh, became useful in transforming society. In chapter six of the book that looks at the 18th century, you now begin to find the connections of the Yoruba to the Atlantic world, creating internal revolutions, creating the expansion of commerce, creating the building of kingdoms, creating the accumulation of wealth, creating the redefinition of society, shaping gender roles, shaping relationship between kingship and kinship, and shaping an intellectual orientation. In later centuries, people began to divide African history to traditional Africa, modern Africa. And many of these turned out to be very misleading. And I will illustrate with a few examples about how these concepts were misleading. By the 17th century, many of what you call uh, European traditions had spread to parts of Africa. People were surprised when they discovered that there were already French bread in parts of the Yoruba Empire and Benin Republic by the 17th century. They were surprised to find European objects. An archaeologist in Ghana were also surprised to find objects from China. The, the, that empire in the 18th century his outreach was so extensive that goods came as far as North Africa and it, it, it inserted itself not just into modernity, but into global forces. And by so doing, was able to become part of a larger global cultural exchanges. It is important to realize this as we frame notions of modernity and tradition that what you call European modernity, as it has been argued, had elements of contributions from West African empires and some of the Asian. And what you call European commodities, European goods, leather products were also connected to this extensive traffic. What people do also not talk about is how the regions of contemporary Côte d'Ivoire and Mali, areas that you call the Mali Empire, Ghana Empire, Songa Empire. They were connected with the Yoruba and people moved across the savannah using the traffic and the stability of this empire. That extensive movement we have not been able to track. The book wrote four chapters on the 19th century which was very important in terms of the spread of the missionary activities, the creation of a new elite, the expansive network between Lagos and globalizing cities, the coming of the British, and the Yoruba wars that shaped uh, many of the contemporary activities of the 20th century. It was an age of transformation, an age of revolution in terms of Western education, 
new religion, the definition of Yoruba spaces, the emergence of new states, as in the empire of Ibadan, the rise of new cities like Abe Okuta, Obomosho, Iloni, all establishing their own dominant politics. It was also an age of revolution in trade in which the Yoruba inserted themselves into a global marketing network, selling cocoa and palm kernel and palm oil and receiving in, re in return uh, European commodities. So that by the 19th century, many of what you call international objects, from mirrors to clothes to luxury items, had become elements of Yoruba goods that circulated very widely. When we entered the 20th century, you began to see the continuity of practices which we discuss in three chapters, the economic basis from the long pre-colonial history consolidated in the colonial, the rise of the Orisha and the Yoruba, the entire zone of aesthetics, body adornment, music and arts, which continue to flourish ever since. And today, Yoruba dominant figures like Asha, Tiwa Savage, Gold, Saniade, Abini Saube, Belakuti, they built on these previous talents for their globalizing uh, the Yoruba people and their cultures. The Yoruba entered the colonial stage, state like other Nigerian states, like other African countries. And in chapter 14, we look at the rise of a new identity, changing former economy, the, the, the rise of education as a source of mobility, how new uh, arrangements developed in cities and how a new social network emerged in ways in which the Yoruba also become not just a dominant uh, intellectual space in Nigeria, but in the world, a knowledge economy developed, which has been built upon with many universities today, uh, so many, both private and public, building on a long tradition and a long heritage. The post-colonial period, which closes the book, looks at the struggles for power in Nigeria, the politics of federalism, the struggles among the elite, the desire to have Yoruba to become the presidents of the country, the troubles and tribulations, various elections. In all these struggles, major figures emerged uh, dominating the political space. Uh, the Yoruba became part of the central issues, central people in the politics of modern Nigeria. Uh, in, an, in all the major arguments that involve federalism, secession, consolidation of power, you find the Yoruba being represented. And the politics in this, in federal Nigeria, began to shape uh, Yoruba identity and began to lead to new conversation about whether they should create what they call an Odudua Republic in modern Nigeria. Um, there have always been uh, arguments and conversation as to whether the Yoruba should remain in Nigeria or as to whether they should create their own country. That modern politics remains with us. And the challenges of modern democracy return, remain with us. Let me uh, close this conversation by talking about the achievements of this book. 
The first is that for those of you who do not want to read many books, this is a one-stop book for you. And for those of you who are already embedded in the scholarship, it offers a major advantage. The, my co-author is an archaeologist, and this is one of the very first books to successfully integrate using archaeological evidence uh, to a long durée understanding of the Yoruba people. It's, um, that archaeological part is intensely original uh, and it covers the early period, blending it with modernity. Second, if some books have um, centralized the role of Oyo and Ife, this book does not ignore them, but it moves beyond Oyo and Ife to pay critical attention to other kingdoms and to demonstrate their relevance. Third, you find uh, cogent analysis on the economy, focusing on issues of agriculture, distribution, the organization of labor. It is also one of the very first books to integrate, to integrate Islam into the analysis, focusing on the Islamic factor among the Yoruba. And that Islamic factor keeps building up in contemporary society. How uh, that integration you will not find in many previous books. And we also integrate social forces, cultural forces, political forces, the role of gender, bringing uh, into uh, conversation with other established ideas on politics. And it's also the first book to integrate the Yoruba and the diaspora in Cuba, in Brazil, in the US, to developments in, among the Yoruba in West Africa. So the, this, this, these major themes put together in one book uh, creates relevance for the book. And it means for those being introduced for the first time to Yoruba studies, a book they can actually consult before they read other books. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm glad to take as many questions as you have. And if the time is not enough, if you send me an email, I will, con I will continue to answer your questions by email. Thank you. What is it about Yoruba? One the question is from Gromko Dumeje. Uh, so many things. Look at the number. The Yoruba are bigger than so many countries. They're bigger to all the Scandinavian countries. They're bigger than the state of Israel. They're bigger than Senegal, bigger than Gambia, so many countries. So that size is an advantage. And that language on its own can sustain the educational system from the elementary to the university level. In other words, the number of speakers is enough to sustain a knowledge economy. Why they have not been doing it uh, is a question that we can ask. And then you have a large intellectual community all over the world in virtually all fields, whether you talk about medicine or you talk about the humanities, you find how, how the Yoruba factor is very big. My city, where I was born, Ibadan, we call it the intellectual capital of, of the country, just because of the intensity of the knowledge that it has generated. 
within the radius of 30 minutes, anywhere you turn in Ibadan, there's a university. And then you have the role of the Yoruba uh, in politics. Major figures like MK Wabiola, who successfully ran to become president, Obasanjo, who had been president uh, under the military and the civilian uh, rule twice. And if, if it's in business, the economy of Lagos, the GDP of Lagos is bigger than that of Ghana. Uh, just to put things in perspective, when you combine all this, you find uh, you can centralize the Yoruba in terms of its economic power, in terms of its intellectual power, in terms of its population, in terms of its global relevance, in terms of its international network. Question, please. Somebody asked a question regarding secession. So in the 50s, you find as Nigeria prepared for independence, uh, there have been talks about the nature of that federalism in which the various regions were struggling to be at peace with one another. The country obtained its independence in 1960. Very quickly, the politics unraveled. By 67, Biafra declared its independence. Um, since 1970, two forces have been at work in understanding the history of Nigeria. Forces that pull them to the center and forces that pull them apart. So what usually unites them is soccer. So if you can imagine if Nigerians play soccer every day, they will be united. But that's not possible. Uh, as people complain regarding the distribution of resources, complaints about differential pace in development, conversation, on differential space, space on modernity, some people begin to say, maybe the bigger size of Nigeria is slowing them down. And in the last few years, because of various crises, the Boko Haram in the Northeast, the activities of the eight men, insecurity in the country, People come up with the argument that is it not possible for each part of the region to go alone? And some elements of Yoruba politicians have been advocating this. So the question is, do you want a bigger Nigeria where that size can protect you? I am for that, and I'm also for Pan-Africanism. Or do you want a fragmented Nigeria where Coca-Cola will be richer than your country? Bear in mind, we now have non-governmental individuals. We now have enormous amount of money in the pockets of a few individuals. India has seven billionaires. We now have people like Bill Gates and their individuals who have more money than countries who can actually buy a country if it is offered for sale. So do you want to forgo the advantage of size? Or do you want to stay within that size and struggle for semi-autonomy and convert your knowledge economy into building a formidable fourth industrial revolution? I've made the arguments in, in so many convocation lectures that by now, Lagos, the Yoruba people, may no longer be needing revenues from oil. Rather, they can develop a knowledge economy where their universities can produce people with talents and skills to feed 
the entire world for outsourcing, for skills transferred to other places. That knowledge economy can supply the entire West African re region with well-trained human power. And this is something they can also be thinking about instead of thinking about secession. Thank you, Mr. Colin, for that question. I appreciate it. Next question, please. My question, I've not found that is how does the word Yoruba come to be used to identify a group of people? Thank you very much. When I was talking about the enslavement of the Yoruba, I mentioned there were two points, but I forgot the second one, which is uh, in the 19th century, during the abolition of the slave trade, Sierra Leone and Liberia began to receive uh, freed people, freed from the Americas and freed from captured on the sea. And many Yoruba find themselves in Sierra Leone forming the Creole, and they were calling them Aku, A-K-U. In Brazil and Cuba, they were calling them the Aku and calling them Eku. It's a form of greeting. If you've been to Ibadan or to Oyo, they greet you, Aku, Eku, Eku, and they give them that name. So as an identity, it's been long established. So, and in the 19th century record, in Haiti record, in Cuban record, Brazilian record, they call them Lukumi, L-U-K-U-M-I or L-U-C-U-M-I. They call them Aku, they call them Yoruba. It was in the 19th century that the modernizing elite in Sierra Leone, under the influence of Ajayi Crowder and later on Samuel Johnson, began to popularize the use of the Yoruba. And bear in mind, it became one of the earliest African cultures and group to develop an orthography. And with very little modification, that orthography has remained since the 19th century. That orthography derived from how the Oyo, who formed the Oyo empire, used that language. But very quickly, the Yoruba modernizing elite in Syria alone and in Lagos settled for that orthography. And by 1897, when Samuel Johnson was writing the first major book on the Yoruba, that orthography had become well established and very well accepted. So that by the time you get to the 20th century, Yoruba becomes to be used not just as a language, but as an identity, as a definition of Southwestern Nigeria. And, and if you cross the Republic of Benin as a dominant cultural influence in the Southern part of the Republic of Benin. And if you keep traveling to Togo and to the Efe, you begin to see the Yoruba factor. If you turn to the sea, the Atlantic Ocean, that sea had been used for centuries as a carrier of trade. Abe Okuta, the modern city that was formed in the 19th century, one of the biggest suppliers of Adire, established a long trading route that stretched as far as Abidjan, selling those materials. For those of us who study migrations, you are going to find the Yoruba in Senegal, Republic of Benin, Togo, Ghana, uh, um, Gambia, in large numbers, not as a contemporary phenomenon. This phenomenon had been there. If you go to Gambia, if you say, I want to eat Akara, it's the same in Bahia, Akara. If the same in Republic of Benin, it's the same in Lagos, the same in Ibadan, or the mass parade. There's an annual mass parade festival in the Gambia, which is a Yoruba festival. To Tamale, Kumasi, you are going to find large Yoruba communities there. Remember the government of Busia, 
send them packing. For those of you who know the maps very well, there are three routes that link the Yoruba across the entire West African belt. What many of you are familiar with is the coastal routes, which is still there. Remember, when the traffic is good and the road is good and the customs don't disturb you, from Lagos to Accra, it's less than a seven hour trip by road. And you can keep going. You can keep going in the 60s, 70s, the major singers, Aruna and Shola Yusuf, rich people in Abidjan and Cote d'Ivoire, when they wanted to do a wedding, naming ceremony, their bad days, they sent for bands in Lagos, Abeokuta, to play for them. Then there's the Savannah Road, which you can use. For those of you who know the map very well, the area of the Loring of Boma Shore that you call the Savannah Belt, Belt, you don't have to go all the way to Lagos to link with the rest of West Africa. You can take a bicycle from Nigeria and you can, you can, you, you can take your bicycle from the Igbo area in areas that you call Northern Nigeria and ride your bicycle to Ghana. In the seventies, I, in my Volkswagen Beetle, I made that trip traversing four countries in West Africa. So the map makes it look bigger than what it is. But culturally, culturally, it is very dense. And when next you go to Lagos, the traffic is bad, but if you can uh, overcome the initial one, by the time you get to Badagri, you are going to be you're going to be seeing a complex, complex society. Fun, Yoruba, Awori, Egun. And if you keep traveling up until the area of Senegal, you're going to find that complexity. So that indeed, if there is a possibility to build a formidable West African regional market based on the traditions, the cultures that had been there for centuries. Thank you. Next question, please. Questions? Questions? Do you, do you see that question, Twin? No, the last question that I saw is the one that I answered. How does the Yoruba... Would you like to scroll down? Um, can you scroll down? This one starts, what exactly is the import? Oh, the import of Islamic factor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very grateful. So, the the... Yoruba people are divided by religion. It is not a one zone, uh, one zone group. And I will use myself as an example. I come from Christian families, but on my mother's side, they were Muslims and they still Muslims. My grandfather was a pastor, a church pastor, but his wife was a Muslim. I hope you're listening very carefully. When they were looking for a child, it was very difficult. And they, they tried the Christian priests, they tried the Islamic priest, they could not get a child who became my mom. And they went to the God 
of thunder and lightning called Shango. And it was Shango, according to their belief, that gave them my mother. This story, just of about me, illustrates for many years the Yoruba understanding of religion, tolerance. For many years, the Yoruba believed that you should not fight the other person because of religion. You should not. And they framed the argument by saying, you, you are not God. You do not know who is going to seal salvation, who is going to be saved in the great beyond. Why don't you leave the other person alone? Then comes the family organizing. There is no Yoruba family without a combination of members from those religions. Then comes kingship. That kingship until recently in some places among the Yoruba, whether it's only of Ife or the Alafia for your, they must recognize all those religions, celebrate with them, participate in their festival. To get back to myself as an example, I was a singer when I was a teenager, playing what is called weary, which became Fuji music today, popularized by Anjindi Barista for Linton, and with a host of younger people now dominating the space, Kwam, K1. I participated in it in the middle of the night, singing, composing songs. Nobody stopped me as a Christian. And when Muslims were doing their festivals, we joined them. And at Christmas, we shared food together. That Islamic factor has been dominant. And you find zones like Ibadan, Ede, in your question, I think by Jacob Babajide, you find how the impact of Islam is major. The European Union funded a major research of which I was a member of the board, led Professor Insanote of the School of West African Studies, University of Birmingham in England, on the daily lives of Muslims, a major project focusing on a number of cities, notably Ede, and they find how Islam has penetrated many aspects of cultures, many dimensions of Yoruba life. But it's not a new phenomenon. Islam has been coming, moving peacefully to the south. Remember, the Yoruba word for Islam in Malay, some people will say it means religion that came from Mali. The area of Mali Empire, where you spoke about Mansa Musa, you spoke about Sundiata, Songhai, people do not know that there, there was an extensive traffic between Western Sudan, Central Sudan, Eastern Sudan, we've been able to trace, and we have scholars who drew that, that interaction between, and it looks as if it's so far away on the map. In actual fact, it's not, in terms of the cultural traffic. Islam has been coming from that area of the Western Sudan, and people will speculate that the Yoruba word for Islam in Malay is, simply means Mali. Of course, in stigmatizing the religion, some Christians redefined the meaning of that word. By the 18th century, Islamic communities had grown in various parts of Yoruba area, Lagos, the Oyo Empire, Ilori. But what we speak about was the jihad, the jihad of Uthman Danfodio in the early years of the 19th century that transformed northern Nigeria, 
replacing the Hausa kings with Fulani emirs. The northern part of the Yoruba places, Ilori, was also affected by that, in which power shifted from the Yoruba to the Fulani, so that we now have the emir of Ilori. But if you look at all the emirs of Ilori, you find that the Bia Yoruba names, the Bia Yoruba names, the current one, they speak Yoruba. They're full of names, but they speak Yoruba. They see themselves as Yoruba. If you see the, the, the prominent member of the Buhari administration now, Ibrahim Gambari, who is from Milani, he speaks Yoruba. His name is Abuola. There are many like that. And that Islamic factor has remained. What is creating problems today is how uh, aggressive conversion, the rise of fundamentalism, the rise of Pentecostalism is creating a wide range of challenges and conflicts in religion. And it is something that people should talk about and they should prevent the rise of conflicts in the region. Thank you for that question. Uh, the question from Remishunaya, is that, the, is that the Islamic factor from her? How do you see the future of Yoruba culture and the language against, this is from Dr. Kole Odutola, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. And people will, will never stop asking this question. And people are worried. They are worried because now we have Yoruba or just Yoruba names. That's one that is there. They are worried because there are thousands of Yoruba in the diaspora. They bear Yoruba names. They are worried because even in Lagos or Ibadan, among the Yoruba, children born in Nigeria, Republic of Benin, who speak only English or French, they are worried about that. And they are worried about the fear that the language can go into disuse. And why are they worried? because we have endangered languages. We already have a number of African languages that are endangered. And the United Nations, UNESCO, they are worried about all of that. But they are also worried about issues around culture. And on this, there are new opportunities and there are fresh challenges. As to new opportunities, People should appreciate the expansive role of technology in the preservation of aspects of culture. I mentioned Nollywood some time ago. It is actually Nollywood and that technology, they are contributing to cultural retention. People should appreciate uh, interest in the languages in universities, in schools. Western universities, that is ongoing. And people should appreciate that that number is very protective. You can't just have 40 million people and their language will become extinct. Having said that, there's a lot of work to do. One is to go back to Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, and begin to study many of what they've done in terms of cultural retention, begin to study many of what they have done in terms of integrating Yoruba religion and culture into modern practices. Although things like divination move from the Yoruba across the Atlantic to Brazil, to Cuba, we have so many things to learn from them. Second is the fusion, which we attempted when I was 
teaching at the Obafe Meolo University. In fact, the university bought a Yoruba house in Brazil. And you find Vijay, uh, Nascimento, Olabi Yai, all of them are fusing these transatlantic Atlantic connections. We have to return to that. When the people started the Orisha Day, we have to empower that. A third is to create powerful academic, intellectual, cultural, activist interest in the promotion of languages. Also remember, in the 70s, the University of Ife pioneered the teaching of Yoruba in schools. They established pilot projects, a six-year pilot project that you use only Yoruba to teach throughout the elementary years till the age of 12. Babs Fafunwa, Professor B.C. Afolayan, Chivai Sigdelano, Michael Afolayan, who is still alive, they pioneered this project and we have to return to it. Not just as a pilot project, but insisting on the use of the Yoruba to teach in schools. In other words, we have to embark upon transformational projects. We have to create movements. But in this, we have to appeal to Pentecostalists, to Christians, some of who are among us. Years ago, we used to have a prominent politician by the name of Bolaike, who became the Attorney General of Nigeria. He was the governor of my state. He was a major figure. And we tried to revive an annual Yoruba festivals. We held a series of meetings. And one person suggested we should go and get the blessing of Pastor Adeboe, the leader of the Redeemer's Church. Why? Because the Pentecostalists, Christians are making one fundamental error. They are confusing Asha with Essi. They are confusing culture with religion. They are confusing Christianity with tradition. And in that confusion, why they themselves borrow from those indigenous cultures? Next time you listen to the major Pentecostal leader, the boy, listen to his prayer, listen to his sermons. You are going to find Yoruba influence in the way he puts his sermons and prayers together. But we have to appeal to them to please make a distinction between religion and culture. Make a distinction between religious practices and customs and cultural practices. They shouldn't say the masquerade as paganistic in quote. You may argue that, okay, the masquerade is no longer coming from heaven, but it does not mean you cannot integrate the practices into modern festivals. And the city days, Yoruba city celebrations, Elisha Day, Ibadan Day, we have to appeal to our Pentecostalist brothers that they should let people celebrate that. Is it possible? Yes. The Catholics allow the Yam Festival among the Igbo. In fact, they, they integrated it into an annual event which the Catholic Church supported. The same thing was done in Brazil, in Cuba, Yoruba gods and goddesses, they gave them new names like Angel Gabriel. The angels became used to label Yoruba gods and goddesses. We have to appeal to fundamentalist Muslims not to destroy elements of these cultures. And we have to, it's, it's a major appeal we have to do because by, by attacking what they call pagan, paganistic religion 
or pagan practices, they are doing a lot of damage to those cultures. Thank you.